Okay, uh, let's get started. So welcome to the Coral Queen today. And uh, today I am the speakers because uh, it's very hard for me to look for other speakers. And also I have other motivation to give a talk to share about uh, some knowledge about supernova. And uh, this is probably maybe the less unlike talk because I think we probably will switch to the, the impersonal talk soon. At least next week's talk will be in person and in the first floor. And uh, so hopefully the COVID will come very soon and uh, we at least we can get live with the COVID. And uh, Today, I am going to talk about some of my research about supernova. So let me share my screen. And uh, I think everyone can see there's uh, exploding stars in my slide. So just a brief introduction about the speaker, about me. I just, uh, I come to ASIA in 2018 as a system research fellow. Before that, I was a EA core fellow at the NAOJ also at one year at the ASIA. Before that, I was a IAU Google fellow at the UC Santa Cruz. And I got a PhD from University of Minnesota in 2013. In my research experience, uh, expert is on the supernovas. Today, I just speak one of my uh, type of supernova to you. When I come to ISIA, I was fortunate to work with some very bright people, students, on the very exciting research topics. And also thanks to Spongy support from, from our previous director, Yo Hua, and also the other people, other colleagues. And uh, these my research groups, mainly other from the undergraduates and PhD students. Some of them are studying abroad. Actually, some of them are getting their PhD very soon. So time flies. And uh, also my baby boy was born in the same year in this 2018. This is our research. But uh, unfortunately, that's a research actually mostly by the students. But unfortunately, in this talk, I won't be able to talk too much about their research. And uh, I will leave the opportunity for Len to give talks at the later, the lunch talk will be soon, very really soon in August. And uh, I also advertise if you are interested in giving a lunch talk, you can talk to Yi Kuan or the Xiu Xian. And those are the students' research we cover quite a broad field, and uh, especially some of uh, explosive phenomena in the universe, ranging from how massive star evolve, how the mass lost, how they are feedback to the environment and influence the molecular cloud ever star formation in the early universe. Also, some exciting topic about the supermassive black hole and the host galaxies, and also the cosmological scale. So those are the work mainly led by students, also collaborate with folks uh, in foreign countries. What I want to give this talk, actually this talk is associated with the Charles Prize. As we know, there is no price, Nobel Prize for astronomy, but there is a comparable prize so called Schultz Prize. And the, the kind of goal for Schultz Prize is grasp the law of nature and make use of it. 
zhi tian ming er yong zhi. So this is a very big prize, and uh, it actually has much more award money than the Nobel Prize, and it is a award in the East. And uh, he also tried to recognize the achievement done by the outstanding researcher and for their contribution to the mankind. Why is the short price relevant to this talk? Because last year there was a short price given to two these outstanding ladies for their discovery about the Megan House. And uh, I was invited by the Chinese University of Hong Kong to give a colloquium as a warm up lectures for the Charles Price lecture. So I prepared these lectures and uh, I think it will be also interesting to share with you about this talk. So astronomers, like our observers, we cannot make a universe in the lab. So what can we do is we observe. We observe mostly from the lights from the universe. So astronomers uh, look for huge, to build a huge telescope with very high resolutions. And I'll see these fine structures like a star formation sign, and uh, that's really exciting. Astronomers will seem to be happy. And uh, with the uh, advance of the telescope and the resolution, like uh, from Hubble and to recently the James Webb, we now see something quite weird. Is a Godzilla or is a, is a life? So that's quite weird. So even the cat has a question about these structures. So theories can help. And uh, we try to understand what we observe. What is the physics behind these astrophysical objects? And what can we learn from them? So theories is the people try to understand by thinking, like Einstein. So Einstein say, my mind is my laboratory. And the, what series needs is a, a pen, a paper, maybe plus a pipe, a cigarette, and maybe a pacifier. So this series can help to understand what the observational data. Although series can understand, but the equation actually is for simple universe. So don't look at this screen, uh, this black hole looked like a, quite a mess, but uh, they actually contain called the elegant equations can describe the universe, the fundamental physical law to describe the universe. So reductive simple. But uh, what observer tell us is this, and the universe is beautiful, but the universe is complex, it's very complex. So those are the, those, these are the molecular cloud structural to form new form stars. And the, some of the, our research at ASI, they are active are working in the star formation area. And uh, look like uh, not really an order of thing, uh, pattern can si simply describe this. Other things like a uh, radiation regime from the Massive star H2 region from massive star, they blow up very strong wings. And those are the wings that form the big structures. And uh, that's very important because they play important feedback in the universe. Even like our Jupiter, Jupiter is a sphere. It's, oh, should be no simpler is a sphere, is a nice, nice, nice structures. But then when you look at the Jupiter closely and look into the details, what these patterns of, it's beautiful, but what are the patterns mean? How they form and what the physics 
from it. It, it, it's not that simple because those are important, important. But what is this? Those are the so-called turbulence. So this is the Richard Feynman said. Nobody in physics has really been able to analyze it mathematically in the satisfied way of the its importance to the the sister science. So turbulence is really really difficult, but however. In the real world, the turbine actually exists almost everywhere in the universe. So most of objects we see from the observation in turbines, mercury clouds, even the stars, even supernova, blah, blah, blah. So now it's no longer like simple, like Einstein's area. You can just use a pen, this paper, and you derive the equation and try to get understanding about the turbulence. No, it's it's not it, it's not possible in this way. Because we don't have a good mathematical formula to describe the turbulence. So, however, we need other things. So another group of series called simulate, they, they come out. So they use a pen and pencil of steel. Recursion. And now they use the much bigger toys, the computer, supercomputers, and even larger supercomputers. Those are the tools for them to help the simulate to do to study the universe. So we also have telescope at our SIA. So we actually have a few clusters at the SIA. Actually, we get a at, four, at least four clusters at this moment. And the latest cluster called Kawas is about have 2,000 coal. So actually it's quite decent. Maybe it's one of the, maybe in terms of in Taiwan, we have a, like a very strong, powerful in-house machines than other, most of the institutes. These are our new machines. So especially thanks to the people behind to push out this machine, especially our directors and uh, VPs and also senior colleagues, especially the Ming Kai and also, also Yao Huan and Sen to put everything and the hero to put everything together. So once that we have the tool, we have the formula, now we want to simulate. So we write the code and write the code to ask the computer to do a simulation, to do a calculation for us. And what is a simulation? A simulation is a mega virtual world based on the law of physics. So here is showing this uh, liquid. This actually is the simulation simulate when you at the beginning dumping the water into a into a box and the colors represent the velocity of the water and individual particle you can see just like a droplet of the water so it looks like a quite something thing because you can see the motion of fluid how you react how you become equilibrium so they really have some kind of actually reality in these simulations. Another thing is I want to show you my favorite simulation. So it's actually the simulation simulate the mixing of the black and white. And the black you can think about is a black coffee. And the white you think about the milk. And this a uh, this a uh, green uh but Orange-ish structures is a uh, spoons, and uh, you you rotate the spoons and push some of the, the coffee into the milk, then return to also the milk to the coffees, and at the same time, at the edge of the spoon, it start to drive a turbulence. Those are AD structures. And those are AD structures is help 
to mix between coffee and milk. So without turbans, actually, probably it will take forever to mix to to make a milk tea. So this turbans has still have very useful for us. So eventually, coffee and milk gradually to mix up into something like a milk tea, milk coffee, latte. So this is actually the reality shows. So you can see actually there's a, some similarity between the simulations and the, 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 the real, real situations. But then why can we believe in simulations? That's because we believe we have faith in math, physics, and trust people and the, and the computer. So we can think about, we can create something virtual and uh, something maybe physical. <laughs> okay, I tell you, I demonstrate, tell you about, okay, we can use the uh, mathematical formulas and the computer to create simulation to understand the real world, the like a mixing of the coffee and milk. But then how we do with the reality, for example, let's first look at the star, especially the massive stars. I really the fan of the massive stars because there are billions of stars in a galaxy. But the massive stars are rare, relatively rare, but they play a very important role in the so-called bionicle cycles in the galaxies. The wind, the radiation, and the exploding of this massive star, they create an ecosystem to form the giant molecular cloud, to form the newborn star, to form the galaxy we observe. So the massive star actually is really important. So those are the two images showing this uh, observational image from the different nebulas to show the massive star formation sites. Okay, so we know massive stars and the first thing I would like to tell you about is how star evolved. So the evolution of star or so-called stellar evolution, the most important quantity decide how star evolved is its mass. So from the lower mass to higher mass, the effect completely different, the evolution track completely different. That's associated because the inner physics, internal nuclear reaction happen, happen really different. So for example, for this 0.1 or 0.2 solar mass star, the so-called brown dwarf. They will like a star never die. They will just like a never die. They just burn, burn hydrogen, burn hydrogen, and burn very slowly, and they just like they sort of live forever. And for the one solar mass star like our sun, it's more interesting because we have very giant face. We also found a planetary nebula, beautiful planetary nebula. We we'll eventually form a white dwarf, then eventually gradually cool down. These are the so-called low mass star case. For the massive star, we usually refer to star have more than 10 solar masses. So these are the more interesting case. For example, for the 10 solar mass star, they will evolve into blue super giant and then red super giant. They will become a core collapse supernova, so-called type two supernova, and left a neutron star here. For more massive ones, 35 solar mass, they evolve through blue super giant, type two supernova, and may left the black hole at the center. For the 60 solar mass star, they evolve again, similar to 35, but uh, they collapse into black hole directly without supernova. 
For 150, they are more interesting. They also have a supernova explosion at the end. This called pair instability supernova. So this eventually give you a roughly picture about how the star evolved from different mass. Today's talk will be focused on being the, this intermediate range of the mass. Try to give you a sense about how the two 20 solar mass stars evolve in spinning phases. So at the beginning, the star form, they burn into the hydrogen, so-called the main sequence. So the main sequence for this 20 solar mass star will be about 10 million years. They turn the hydrogen into helium. Then again, again, do the helium burning at the core. Now the burning time shrink from 10 million years to 1 million years. Then later they burn into the carbon. They enter so-called advanced bending stage. Those are the from 1 million year helium burning become 1,000 year. So the time was shrinking and shrinking Eventually, to the silicon burning, everything will burn to this iron. And because you cannot get energy from iron, so iron coal will just build up. Those will give you actually burning the iron to iron just less than just about one week. So the time range, the time, time range is quite different and for each different burning stage. So why the burning stage shrinks so much? Because the central temperature become really high. So neutrino energy rules become dominant. So neutrino take away a lot of energy very efficiently. So you, the core will be burned violently to supply this neutrino. So that's why you burn out the fuel very quickly. So how star dies, how do they explode is a very interesting and very important topic in the astrophysics. And it has been studying for many years. So for the low mass, I mean low mass is from 10 to 20 solar mass case, the burn exposure would believe is from so-called the neutrino and the exposure powered by the, from the neutron star. For about 20 solar mass, you need an additional energy, maybe the rotational energy of the neutron stars. For 35 to have exposure, in, then you need to have even something black hole accretion to do the power to do the exposures. So I was fortunately to work with some of the two of the leading experts in the field, the Hager was my PhD advisor, and the Rusli was my postdoctoral host. So I've been learning a lot from them about the exploding the stars. Also for my the thesis directions. So I want to tell you about how to explore stars. Other story. So when the star burning just after the silicon burning, they build into the iron core. And this core will build up and build up in mass. And uh, however, at this time, the core will be supported by electron degeneracy pressures. So it had uh, some limit. However, building on the mass, eventually the gravity of the core is too strong, then you crush the entire core, and it becomes free fall. And during the fall, free fall, enter this core construction, the first stage. And the core construction, neutrino will also be emit, but not most violent at this time. And until the core at the very center, because just like it put a lot of snow, pipe a lot of snow, then you will form the ice at the center. The center will become, become very, hard, the solid, and the hard, it's called the hard, coal hardens. And the, because the coal become hard, the material falling on the hard star will bounce. Then you will create a bounce shock. And this shock will be created. 
in some case, this shark can just explore the entire star, but in the most case, it won't. Because when the shark propagates, it will be energy will be absorbed by the, by the informing material because the energy will be used to dissociate the nuclei. It, it are a lot of new energies. However, and the, the shark can be stored, the central the neutrino formation into the new due to the neutral photon neutron star formation, emit a lot of neutrinos. And that neutrinos will be actually able to act to support the shock and to push out the shock and eventually you become the explosions. So this is actually the idea. And let's do the same simple formula, simple equations. So basically, you think about how much energy can ion code a variable. You just do this equation, gravitational energy, gm squared divided by r, and then put a number of 1.5 solar mass, 10 kilometer. Then roughly about three times four, 10 to 40, uh, 53 ergs energy. And this uh, energy collapse will relate into the different favors of the neutrinos. Six favor, electron, muon, tau, and then tiny neutrino. And those neutrinos will propagate out because in the most of, in the normal cases, the neutrino actually have very, very little interaction with gas. So in most of cases, it just shrink out. But the, in this environment, the material is so dense, the neutrino energy is really high. So they start to have interacting with gas. So such inter interacting, you can use so-called diffusion equation to describe this process. So how much time will be the text for the neutrino to diffuse out? That depends on the mean free pairs. The mean free pairs will depend on the opacity and the density. And you do the scattering uh, opacity plus absorptional opacity, because this opacity will just measure the interaction between the neutrino and the and the, this gas. And the ones that are interacting, then the gas will get the energy from neutrino, and that will be due to explosions. So putting the number from the 10 to 14 grand in density, the mean free per center 13 centimeters. So mean effect is actually quite short in this case because it will travel about 20 kilometers. So like a few seconds for the neutrino to diffuse out, but that's sufficient. That is sufficient for neutrino to just dump 1% of the energy on the gas. And that is sufficient to unbind the entire star and make the explosions. This is in theory. But the, what is the reality? This is the reality. It's hard. Why is hard? Because the neutrinos, difficult physics, tough physics, the new the nuclear equation of state and neutrino physics and the opacity is still quite uncertain for these kind of studies. So this is people are working on nuclear physics will be working taught to this part. Like the Monglu by the SLP are uh, also working on this neutrino physics, study this part. And the second question is, uh, is a tough problem computationally. Because you try to do a 3D model, a six favors neutrinos, and uh, you follow the multi energy of this neutrino and also consider the angles. That is at least, at least seven dimension, seven dimensional simulation, like a X, Y, Z in your three instead of X, Y, Z. Then you have a neutrino energy, just say it's one band, and then you have C to five direction, and you also have other physics. So that's really, really difficult. It's much difficult than the normal hydro simulation. <laughs> and also other physics, 
for example, the magnetic field, the associated with the magnetite that we will discuss about today. And also location may be also important. Unfortunately, or interesting, if that star eventually form a black hole at the end, if you want to do this problem with general relativity, with magnetic hydrodynamics, then all the most tough phases you can see will be included in this study. So that's why it's difficult. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Can I ask? Yes, yes. Uh, see, how, <laughs> see how I'm here. Okay, okay. Um, please, please, please. Do you can, do, when you are treat the neutrino, do you oh. have to consider MSW effect? Or does the yeah. MS, NSW effect important? MSW effect is have one percent importance, so it will change the result by one percent. Only one percent? Yes, yes. People have been study using MSW effect, but it's just one D. The in density 1D. is so high. Why? Why MSW is not important? Only uh, one percent importance. Why? It, it depends on the density, right? Why is it not important? Because as I know is maybe the moon is more no more detail about this. As I know is because the the dumping the energy will be mainly from certain favor of the neutrino. I say think about maybe it should be electron ne neutrino. And uh, as I know, not quite sure is that this MSW effect. And I know maybe the the effect of the electron strong neutrino will be most likely. So the favor change in this, in this case, in the explosion case, will be most likely. However, NFW effect have a play important role in the nuclear synthesis. So because the neutrino will be changed the nuclei and have a so-called mu process, and that mu process will be very sensitive new process result will be very sensitive to this MSW effect. But the okay. explosion itself is not that critical as a best okay. of people you study. All right, all right, good. Thank okay, you. thank you, thank you, Charles. So let's go on. So tell me about some of my works on this path. Is that usually growing up the stars since I was a graduate student, and I do the ex extremely supernova, why I call it extreme? Because this covers some of the non, not typical calculized explosion. I tell you some of the example from the study from lower mass case, from the 12 to 60 solar mass, this so-called low energy supernova. Those are the explosion at the very low energy and they create very faint supernova event. However, this fan event will be have importance to understand some called the so-called metal ball star, the nuclear synthesis patterns. So those are my studies. And also some updates. So the second one is Mangantan, which I will discuss more detail about later, is the after the central neutron star from the Mangantas. That magnetar can play an important role to drive either the explosion or either magnetar luminous, very luminous of these supernovas. So this is a magnetar power supernova. In the third case, into so-called precessional pair instability, the curve become unstable due to the electron pass from pair production, and that will create much of the eruption of the stars. This is also an interesting case because it creates a supernova, a zombie supernova, like a supernova never die, just because the nature of this. Very interesting, but, but I don't have time to talk about this today. The fourth one is a parents to be supernova. It's a single big explosion. It's just like a 100 times type, type 1A supernova. And we believe those are supernova from the Pop three star from the, the first stars. And the fourth one is my baby. It's called a general, general relativity instability supernova. 
This is actually the supernova. It discovered this explosion mechanism like no one else because the explosion is triggered by the general relativity instability. Which, in the sense, need to some detail, but I won't talk much about detail. And you trigger a big collapse. Those are the exploding star from the supermassive star. So what is the supermassive star? It's the star between 50,000 50, to 60,000 solar mass star. What does that mean? Like? Is that star can be hard solar light massive? Yes, because these are the stars we believe they form into so-called atomic cooling halos. And those are the stars we believe they are the sea of the supermassive black hole observed in each galaxy. Those are the seas we believe are the sun of the star, not falling into a black hole, maybe beyond supernova. So those are the, actually the stars and supernova are likely or possibly be observed by the JWST. So that's we made the models and calculate the radiation, calculate observational signal nature. So in the six is do all this and then with radiation and the a detailed atomic cooling physics, atomic physics, try to calculate the light curve and the spectrum. And uh, also very expensive calculation. So that's all the like, like main string of the world on the, on the supernova. So can we draw the star? Actually, we can. We successfully draw another star. This is an example. This is a, a real example. And you can see that exploding is, do you see like a, a brand? Yes, it's like a brand. Do you see this more bloom? Actually, yes, it's all the, the explosion was driven by neutrino convention. And neutrino, due to the multi-dimensional effect, the neutrino will be more effective to have energy on the gas, to dump the energy on the gas, and driven this buoyancy effect, and eventually brought the entire star. So those are the, in simulation, it's possible. But the, what is the most important physics in determining the explosion? It's uncertain because it seems you need to have a good neutrino physics, good hydrodynamics, good resolution, and then maybe we also need to have some kind of transfer or MHD physics to do the explosion. Anyway, when it is bored, then you will see a nice uh, firework, then the supernova remnant like this one. And don't is broad, might collide into a black hole. I'm still interesting. So do we see any real supernova? Yes, we do. And not too far, too long ago. In 1987, there's a supernova, it is about eight, explored very nearby. And uh, this uh, left is the before and right is a big after explosion. See, there's a giant bright spot in the in the left button corners. So supernova are luminous. How luminous are they? You make a comparison. You place the supernova along with the galaxies. And then supernova just look like the call the halo or the, the bulge of the, the, the galaxy. That's, that's billions of star layer. So it's very luminous. And the all interesting, other interesting things is in the historically, the Queen Nebula is actually Chinese people have a history about this supernova and being observed in our histories. And it's so luminous, it even make the night like a, a daytime. But now we have much powerful telescope, for example, like Chunsa telescope, and then look into the detail of the interior of the uh, crime nebula. And we see this like a tornado structures. This is a so-called a Persa wing nebula. What's Persa wing? Because there's first actually rotational neutron star. 
Uh, personally, I feel the neutron star is one of the most interesting objects in the universe because all four fundamental forces are at play. You have gravity, very gravity, GR. You have e electromagnetic field. You have the strong and weak interactions. So 10 kilometers in size, as, as heavy as a, like our sun. And the exhaust simulator fuel inside this neutron star. And the, a rich explosion of the nuclear physics and also gravitational waves. So those are the neutron star in general. Last year, there's two wonderful ladies and been awarded the Charles Prize for the extraordinary contribution to finding so-called Magenta. is a highly magnetized gravity notational neutron star. The Magenta is one of the hardest objects, at least in in the compact realm in, the, in, in, in my field, in, in my interest of study, in the transit. So the Magenta has a very rich of phenomena and can do a lot of things. So what is a magnetar? So magnetar is an ultra powerful magnetic field. It's thousand times stronger than the normal neutron stars, a trillion times stronger magnetic field than the Earth. And in some training case, they even rotate milliseconds. So those are the very, very energetic transits. So the neutron star 101, Megantar 101. So the B field exceeding 10 to 15 Gauss. The original of Megantar might be political dynamo action, which during the collapse of neutron star, photon neutron star formation, the dynamo of the fluid motion able to, to create, to amplify the original field to very large. And the uh, fossil field probably not, um, I feel un unlikely because you just not, you probably, it's, it's, it's difficult to inherit this uh, entire, entire magnetic field flux from the collapsing star. Otherwise it won't collapse, I think. So, so this is a possible formation of the magnetars. So it's still active research area that involve much interesting physics to that study. But the, in terms of phenomena, Megana can do a lot of interesting things because it can create highly energetic cosmic rays. It can produce the gamma ray burst. It can produce the so-called supernova. supernova. It can do fast radio bursts. It's very, very hard. Our director, the way it is a uh, favor, FRBs and you can do so gamma ray burst or gravitational wave. So this object actually now like include some of the most exciting phenomena we are discovering recently and now. So the birth of the Megantha becomes so exciting. Now, I want to tell you something, one of the example for the Megantha's function. I just tell you the supernova is very numerous. However, there's another pion called supernumina supernova. It's 100 times more numerous than the normal supernova. So before you understand what the supernova is, I want to tell you because there are some students and many of you probably not familiar with. So it's better to tell some basic physics about understanding supernovas is luminous, it's very luminous. When we describe the supernova, we use a uh, light curve. It's a luminosity as function of time. And the laws are the so-called transit. So the luminosity is just like it rising and fending, rising and fending. So the way to understand this is that the peak of the luminosity and the, the width of the duration were the two important characteristics for the, the supernova. And below is the spectrums. 
and the spectrum is like a fingerprint of this. So a nice understanding about the supernova. So if I plot the light curve durations and the peak luminosity, most original cockeye supernova were just on these rectangular corners. There's a one type, so-called one day, is more numerous but shorter duration. Those are guys are more discovered in the last one or two decades. They call supernumerous supernova because they that is roughly two hundred times more luminous than this normal co-colored one. And another type is called phantom one. Just I told you about my word, the faint supernova. So the light curve duration is basically will rely on the ejector. So when your explosion occurs, how much mass are being ejected? So the more massive or the more path the duration or longer. So that's that tell you the physics. That tell you the mass of the ejector, the duration. For the peak luminosity, we tell you the luminosity, how bright is it? Will be social with the energy, energetic, but not always energetic, but also what is the radius of photosphere? So you need to have a more numerous case, you have large photo photospheres. So how the magnetic rotation of magnetar can help to power a supernumerous supernova? Those are physics. What's energy from? Energy from the rotational energy of that magnetar. So assuming is the millisecond magnetar, light rotational energy of light, light magnetar was two times 10 to 50 to Earth's energy. That's huge. That's big enough for us. Because a supernumerous supernova will require about 10 to 50 one Earth's of radiation energy. That's sufficient. And then with assuming the radiation will be come out through so-called the, the the more formula, the dipole radiation. So basically it tell you, we have magnetic field, you have a rotation, and the magnetic field attached to a rotational object. So the magnetic field, like, like a brake, like a, like a, some kind of brake, so like our car, the brake, though. So here tap, tap the energy from the rotational energy of the neutron star. And when tap it and comes out with the radiation, so the rotational period is shorter. That means uh, the luminosity will become much, much larger. And if the tapping is strong, the break is strong, you are able to take much more energy. So luminosity will also increase. So those are the things, some formulas to describe how the energy and how the energy being released in this weight. And uh, I just can calculate with the periods, how the period and luminosity and rotational energy evolving with time in this case. So this is good because you think about how we describe Megantar model. Okay, I only know two, I only need two parameters. I want to know the rotational periods of the Megantar. I want to know the magnetic field strength of the Megantar, then that's it. I just need two parameters. I give you two parameters. I will give you all the best fits, all the best explanation. So here is an example. These are 2D exploding magnetar supernova. So this is like an upturned star. And the uh, left, but right left button corner is the center of the star. So the magnetar release a strong wind and energy. Now you push out the supernova ejector comes out. So, and you see the evolving of this ejector will become highly unstable and drive a lot of full instability and let the figurement into these structures. What do we see? Now, this is the structures. So you have the four wall shock from the magnetar, I saw magnetar bubble. And uh, at the center is a magnetar, and the outside there's a boundary called a wind termination shock. This is how high velocity particle hit and to generate the uh, heat. It's also slow down 
and you create a heat, and that heat will push out the outside of the bubble. Uh, between this forward shot and the wind termination shot, there is ray tailing the bit. Those are the actually the interesting structure. And those are the first of the kind of simulation because previous simulation just 1D and uh, they won't be able to review this, all the detailed structure of the Megantar bubble. And uh, these are the calculated light curve. Indeed, if you have magnetic field about few times 10 to 14 Gauss with a mini, few milliseconds of magnetar, that can actually calculate, they can get the light curve to, to fit well with so-called two of these supernova supernova from so-called PDF observation. And so more recently, I really spent much effort to push the front of this research because previous 2D is already, I think it's good, but it's not the perfect because the real case in the industry the D's. And the why the simulation is difficult because we, we try to simulate a supernova environment that is a size as large as like a solar system. But the Megantai itself, just 10 kilometer in size, like a Taipei city. So you simulate a solar system within the innermost resolution reach to 10 kilometers. That's really, really challenge. And I try to figure out this by using a numerical technique, using the evolving the dynamics of the star. So basically I tracing the shock and the, with the expanding domain. So the evolution of the structure, the, the simulation bus actually will be evolved. And the, with high resolution at the shock and also at the center. And uh, those are the approach I try to simulate. So now I make this kind of simulation very expensive. It said two million CPU hours, roughly to do this kind of one simulation in some of the fastest supercomputer in the world. So they'll be able to successfully simulate the entire exporting bubbles from the center of the Megantha to the outside of the supernova environment. And then really see a very interesting structure, layer layers of structures occurs at the different place and driven by the sort of different mechanisms. So those are the special the turbulent structures and the quite important to, especially when we understand, try to understand so-called the mixing in the spectrum of the supernova. And this work has also been interesting to other people. For example, the physics today, maybe our academic civic are interesting. So because uh, I think for personally, I feel this, uh, quite challenging, but quite, quite an interesting work. And uh, I try to push this. I try to do a more detailed study, even with more progenitor, with more detailed radiation hydrophysics. And I try to create the really the relaxing observational signature. And I will be able to compare with the, the now current and the future observation. My JWSD observed one or few of these in the early universe. So some take home message I want to show you and tell you about the magnetized really hard, interesting objects, created dynamic, dynamical event like a gamma ray burst, radio burst, supernova, supernova, gravitational waves, and the, in terms of supernova supernovas, people really like this Megan model. Because I just tell you, this only need two parameters, and then the excellent fit, just excellent fit. But then my simulation tell me, tell us about the missing actually occurred at different stages of Megan power and that break down the symmetry of the stars. And symmetry has been broken. That will be have much interesting phenomena. 
like we mentioned the polarization, you would like a missing the Fourier structure in your spectrum features and can all be explained by the mixing and also only be done by the, this kind of sophisticated multi-dimensional 3D simulations and provide the insight to connect model and observations. And, uh, but uh, still working on have to do much nice physics because, uh, because why? Because some microphysics still missing because we can just add one fit one at a time because one is already at a little difficulty, a little difficulty. So we don't, we have a much physics to add, but we cannot all add our one at once. So basically that's my talk and thank you very much. And uh, thank you much for listening. And uh, I am happy to take any questions from you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Ken, for the very interesting and explosive talk. Uh, do we have any questions for Ken? Uh, please use the raise and function. Zhi Hong, please. <clears throat> um, so, so what you meant is a uh, magnetar doesn't yes. need any signal. Huh? Magnetar explosion mm. doesn't need neutrino. Oh, he doesn't need neutrino. Okay, okay, that's a very good question. So, actually, you think about the magnetar here, we assume the energy release purely from the radiation. So you can think about the radiation brought the entire stuff, the ray, photon pressure the, to brought the stuff. But the, however, the detail about how exactly the magnetar emission mechanism is unknown. Maybe it will be in the form of the, the different particle or cosmic ray, or maybe, maybe neutrinos. So, so is it will be likely have an opportunity, maybe some of the magnetic energy will convert into the neutrino and that neutrino also helps to do the explosion at the earliest time, yeah. So when you, when you say radiation, you mean a real photon, it's not electromagnetic field. It's a real photon, it's a high energy gamma ray, it's a high energy photon. It's a real photon. Uh, um, so the uh, magnetic field doesn't uh, do anything to help. Oh, yeah. So the magnetic field here just is uh, like a assistant role. It it just it just it just help out to extract that energy. So the the field here. Okay, the field. Here, I didn't use any magnetic energy here. The energy budget I use here is about the rotational energy of the magnetar. Yeah. I so, 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 so in your simulation, if yeah. you turn up the magnetic field, mm. you can still explore uh, and pretty much like what you observe here. Yes. Yes. So, here is uh, here the interesting thing. Okay, that's a very interesting, relevant question. So the here assumption is that I I didn't I didn't decay the magnetic 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 field strength is fixed in the simulation. So, but uh, but uh, in reality, I would really think the magnetic field might be decayed due to some maybe diffusion or some process. Like the di diffusion of the magnetic field might be generated, also though some interesting event. So that's I'm been thinking about this. But uh, at the moment, I show you those simulation uh, by assuming the B field is fixed. Hmm. What do you mean by fixed? A fixed means is a strength. The if it is ten to fourteen Gauss, then the it will be ten to fourteen Gauss. I I don't I don't and then it, it won't decay. It won't decay. So it's frozen, frozen in. Yes. Okay. Frozen into the turbulence. 
Toby uh, and yes, yes. Okay, yes. that's really good. Yeah. Okay, fine. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, do we have other questions? King Wen, please. Yeah, thank you for your talk. I'm just curious, you mentioned uh, several observational yes. events like the gamma ray burst or the fast mm -hmm. radio burst. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about whether or not we have better understanding of how those events occurs related to the magnetars or related to the evolution of the system. Uh, okay, so um, evolution of system will be, um, for example, okay, okay. So for the gamma ray burst, if you want to use the magnetar to produce the gamma ray burst, one is you just have a very strongly heavily rotational magnetar and with strong field and the light give you out the energetic photon might be reached the gamma, likely to be gamma ray burst. But the other thing is like a, because the, like Zhi Hong, like the Chui Lao mentioned is, if the magnetar also store a lot of magnetic field energy, and that energy can be released from the neutron star, just like the earthquake. So that's earthquake. They will release the energy. They will also produce a gamma ray burst, even produce a fast radio burst. So those are the burst event can be produced from the magnetars. And the, how the evolution will be, um, basically it's more like a, those events are like a transit. So it's like a, very short period of time. So like earthquake, you have a sudden shake and then you produce gamma ray burst and disappear or produce FRB then disappear. So those are the event. So we don't actually know much about or at least from observationally can be understanding, for example, predict the next burst or predict the scale of next burst like this. So that's, uh, that's uh, I'm not so sure I answered your question, but uh, those are the transit phenomena. So it's short time and just once and uh, driven by different, just what I mentioned, mechanism. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a quick question. So you briefly yes. mentioned yes. that uh, yes. magnetars could play a role in uh, for some gravitational wave events. Oh, could, yes. could you explain more on what kind and how? Okay. So the gravitational event in the magnetar case, okay, that's quite interesting. That actually should be found here. So the thing is, it's more likely if that, you, you want to have a gravitational wave, you have a, a quadruple motion of the masses. And the, the way you can produce from here is the first, for example, you have a two, like a two neutron star merge, two magnetar merge. And the other is uh, the hin if there's an inhomogeneous structure on the surface of the neutron star, there will be also have a possibility, or maybe the uh, earthquake, the, the star quake, a neutron star quake on the on the on the on the on the new magnetars can also produce some of the gravitational waves. But the most interesting case is if you have two magnetar and uh, have mergers, then I would think you have a, a lot of interesting multi-messenger event in this case. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's really interesting because when they feel so strong, so when they touch actually like they will produce some whole effect and they also, likely to become the accelerator for cosmic rays. So they can produce very energetic cosmic rays from this 
even much energy than the, the normal pulsar wind nebula. So those are interesting situations. Mm. I see. I see. Thanks. Mm. Uh, are there other questions for Ken? Okay. Uh, Shen Yuan. Shen Yuan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, just follow up that uh, hmm. gravitational wave. Uh, yes. Question uh, you mentioned about the merger of Mactar. I'm just curious how likely this system will exist. Hmm. What kind of environment you may need to uh, have such systems? Thanks. Uh, I, I think it is uh, okay. Let me let me think about the merger rate. Sure, will be much lower. Is much lower than double neutron star merger, right? Because the magenta probably just we say maybe like a one star. Well, if if you have one, you find one hundred neutron star, probably you only one. One or two of them will be the magenta. So if you want to have two magenta C layer, then you will, the probability will be down to maybe 10 to minus four. So it will be 10,000 times smaller. But uh, this is roughly, rough, roughly a, a close estimation. But uh, in reality, uh, I, I don't. I don't know, but uh, but uh, I believe it will be very very short. Even even we find one neutron star merger is already difficult because due to our the limit of our gravitational wave detector the sensitivity. But uh, in the future, there's a space and uh, even more ground based. I think probably the event rate will be increase twice even. This will be frontier. This is already be very very frontier study of the multi messenger area yeah thanks interesting thank you uh, okay great uh, if there are no more questions let's end here and thanks ken again thank you very much and uh, next week we have a special color queens and uh, we'll be in the first floor Auditorium and uh, it's about the the bullies or the work environment. So because it will be uh, talk in the present Chinese and uh, normally will be arrange another for uh, uh, for for the foreign for English. Okay. Thank you, Yi Kuan. Thanks, everyone. That's no problem. Thank you. See you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.